Shark Week is one of the most loved, feared, and hated weeks on cable TV. And every year it inspires controversy, debate, rabid binge watching, and cupcakes with shark fins sticking out of them. Still, there's plenty to know about the show besides what you've seen on the screen. Shark Week has been around almost as long as the Discovery Channel, which launched in 1985. Just two years later, network executives started wondering how they might be able to convince their potential summertime audience to stop enjoying the sunshine at the beach and waste away in front of the television instead. The most popular Shark Week origin story has executives raising the idea at a drunken after-work party and writing it down on a cocktail napkin. But the most reliable account probably comes from Tom Siebert, who was a 20-something new hire at the fledgling network in 1987. According to Siebert, he raised the idea sarcastically during a brainstorming session. Look, we know the bigger the animal, the bigger the ratings, and if it can kill you, that's the best. So why don't we just air shark shows all summer? The funniest part about this version of the story is that Siebert wasn't even serious. He only threw out the idea because he was annoyed that the network was really just worried about their bottom line, and he later recalled sitting aghast as the idea was actually discussed. That night, the idea was passed along to Discovery's founder and CEO, John Hendricks, who was really into it. Now, three decades later, viewers all get to be pissed off every year because megalodons no longer exist. Shark Week was hostless for the first few years. Then, in 1994, the network landed Peter Benchley, author of Jaws, as its first host. At that time, Benchley was celebrating the 20th anniversary of his best-selling man-eating shark novel, which was the basis for Steven Spielberg's 1975 blockbuster of the same name. Benchley introduced each Shark Week program from a location where the famously terrifying movie had been shot. Proving once and for all that Shark Week isn't about sensationalizing the ocean-dwelling predator, it's about science and education. After Benchley's appearance, Shark Week has featured celebrity hosts regularly. Notable alumni include Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs, comedian Craig Ferguson, Rob Lowe, and supermodel Heidi Klum, because supermodels and sharks have so much in common. Shark Week has some enemies, including marine activists and conservationists, who want us to think that sharks are gentle creatures, like kittens, only with five rows of giant teeth and bloodstained lips. To be fair, though, Discovery has had to stand on both ends of the ratings teeter-totter. Does it air sensationalized programming featuring blood, violence, and death, or does it tell the often boring but much more educational truth about sharks? For example, in 2014, ABC News reported that death by cow is about five times more common than death by shark. Sharks kill an average of four people annually, while cows gore or trample to death an average of 22 people. Audiences probably won't see the Discovery Network's historic launch of Cow Week anytime soon, mostly because cows don't have the aforementioned five rows of giant teeth and blood-stained lips. But hey, maybe all it will take is another sarcastic pitch in a brainstorming session. Here's to hoping. Conservationists are understandably concerned about the sensationalism. It seems like the network features more violence every year, which typically includes dramatized recreations of shark attacks. Such programming creates the false impression that sharks are more dangerous than they are, which has a negative impact on conservation efforts. The truth is that shark populations around the world are in decline, and most people don't seem to care. And although there's no proof that Shark Week is to blame, it's hard for a lot of people to internalize the idea that the great white that just ate some guy on Shark Week needs to be protected. Clearly, all those conservationists have never seen the Sharknado series of films, or they might know that the man-eating instinct is so ingrained in the shark psyche that sharks will attack anything that moves, even after falling thousands of feet out of a passing tornado. But hey, guess what? Sharknado is actually fiction. Yes, it's true. Most sharks will actually die after a 50,000-foot drop, and any that survive wouldn't have much of an appetite. Shark Week does occasionally make an effort to tell the truth about sharks, and this was especially true in the early years. Since then, the network has also invested heavily in some of the world's best videographers and documentarians, and the network has never really lied about the nature of the shark attack. Humans don't live in the ocean, and as such are not on the shark's list of approved snacks. Former Discovery Channel president and general manager W. Clark Bunting told Time Magazine in 2010, We hope that as we tell these stories, people hear the real message. The victims were in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
Studies pretty consistently show that people who watch a lot of crime dramas overestimate their chances of becoming a victim of crime. So it's not really surprising that a similar study by researchers from Indiana University and the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill shows that people who watch Shark Week tend to overestimate their chances of getting eaten by a shark and continue to react with fear. They had 500 people watch clips from Shark Week, from violent shark attacks to sharks swimming peacefully through the water, followed by a public service announcement that talked about the need for shark conservation. Researchers discovered, shockingly, that those short messages after the violent programming didn't seem to make people any less afraid of sharks. Another study, published in Marine Policy, surveyed over 180 people on their shark knowledge and correlated that with supportive conservation efforts. No surprise, the media does play a part in sensationalizing the marine animal and causing anti-shark sentiment. So really, it seems like Shark Week is ultimately doomed to scare people, even if it shows nothing but sharks having tea parties and attending 12-step meetings, a la Finding Nemo. It has been three weeks since my last fish, on my honor, or may I be chopped up and made into soup. Because ultra-slow-motion video of airborne great white sharks and real-life shark bites aren't already more terrifying than fiction, in 2013, Discovery decided what Shark Week needed to do was make stuff up and call it a documentary. The 2013 episode, Megalodon, The Monster Shark Lives, was Shark Week's most watched program of the year, but it was fiction. You had to sit through the entire episode before reading the devastating disclaimer at the very end, which read, None of the institutions or agencies that appear in the film are affiliated with it in any way, nor have approved its contents. In fact, even the disclaimer was misleading. It said that, quote, certain events and characters in this film have been dramatized, that Megalodon was a real shark, and that sightings continue to this day. Basically, it just waxed on in every way without explicitly saying what you just saw was fiction. Despite other clues that the documentary was fake, like really bad CGI, and scientists who were obviously reciting scripted material, some viewers believed what they were seeing. When they learned they'd been duped, they were pretty righteously pissed off. Even so, Shark Week's executive producer Michael Sorensen waved off the backlash and praised the two-hour special as the, quote, ultimate Shark Week fantasy. But by 2015, with the network still reeling from the bad press, executives told Vulture there would be no more fake documentaries. In 2017, Shark Week promos hyped another monster event. 23-time gold medalist Michael Phelps was going to race a great white shark. Now, in all fairness, anyone who stopped to think about it for more than five seconds should have realized that it would have been impossible for Phelps to race an actual great white. Even if you left out the whole part where he'd have probably gotten eaten before crossing the finish line. But, you know, ratings. Sharks don't swim in a straight line. And never mind the logistics of trying to put one in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. But viewers were still pissed off, maybe because they were still smarting from the whole Megalodon thing. It's really hard to blame this one on the network. They were pretty open about the fact that this was not going to be an in-the-flesh race between actual shark and actual man. There were even pre-show interviews in publications like Vanity Fair that explained exactly how it was going to go down. But that didn't stop half the viewing population from feeling annoyed when they were told in the last three minutes of the one-hour program that the race would be a simulation. Ultimately, this story doesn't say as much about the network's drive for ratings as it does about the fact that most of the viewing population doesn't really pay that much attention to disclaimers or, you know, logic. Shark Week might be controversial, but it's not just something that people casually tune into if they're bored on a summer afternoon. Shark Week has cult status, like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. If Dr. Frankenfurter was a great white and Brad and Janet were a pair of hapless surfers wearing chum underpants. According to Talking Point's memo, in 2010, Stephen Colbert famously declared Shark Week to be, quote, one of the two holiest of holidays, with the other being the week after Christmas. And on an episode of 30 Rock, Tracy Morgan once gave the sage advice Live every week like a Shark Week. Fans don't just watch Shark Week, they live Shark Week. Five minutes on Pinterest will give you enough Shark Week party ideas to last until the 2120 installment. Even Martha Stewart is in on the fun, with a whole list of Shark Week ideas, including shark cupcakes, shark-inspired outerwear, and a chair made out of stuffed toy sharks. Yes, a chair made out of stuffed toy sharks. 
Needless to say, we're still waiting for Stuart to drop a walkthrough for meat suits. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.